Well, I love that film too. Now if I can find your guys' bios, yes, I'd put them right here. Yeah, I, I think you can see my enthusiasm for that film. It's just, it is uh, kind of unbelievable. I know that some people will be trickling in here because the uh, start times were a little screwy in different publications, so if they are, we're all, we're all okay with that. Um, so let's see. I wonder how much time we have till 6.30. Does anybody know? We have about... 20 minutes. Okay, so we're going to... I'm going to bring up my guests. And um, first I'm going to start with Howard Cummings. Howard Cummings did one of my favorite shows that's on TV right now called The Nick. And uh, uh, I thought that when he designed Rent, the movie, that it was truly the East Village that I lived in then. And I thought that was incredible to get that right. Um, Magic Mike, Behind the Candelabra. Well, I should say Magic Mike XXL, Behind the, cam the Candelabra. Side effects, Magic Mike Haywire. Um, I don't know, any other ones you want me to point out? There's so many. The Usual Suspects, how could we not forget The Usual Suspects? So Howard, come on up here. This is Howard Cummings. And Howard graduated in 1980, is that right? 80, yep. 80, okay. And then I have, um, let's see, those are my questions. All right, so Kalina Ivanov, most recently collaborated on the upcoming film, The Book of Henry, directed by Cullen Trevorrow. Prior to that, she earned an Emmy and an Art Directors Guild Awards for her designs for Michael Susi's film, Grey Gardens, produced by HBO. She also designed Michael Susi, is that pronounced right? Uh, next film, The Vow, and designed the Golden Globe nominated television show, Smash, season two. She has a long collaboration with director Robert Redford, culminating as his epic theatrical drama, The Conspirator, and her designs were featured in Perspective magazine. Her other notable film designs includes the, the, the Oscar nominated, one of my favorites, Little Miss Sunshine, as well as Max, Poltergeist, Rabbit Hole, Maid of Honor, Brown Sugar, Smoke, and many others. For television, she designed the series Kings and the pilot of Person of Interest among many. Kalina owes much gratitude to her early mentors, Nestor Almendras, Almendras and Jonathan Dem, Demi, Demi. Who, uh, who gave her the opportunity to storyboard such films as Billy Bathgate, The Manchurian Candidate, and The Silence of the Lambs. She is co-founder of the Production Designers Collective, which you can find online and on the board of Sophia Independent Film Festival. Kalina Ivanov. <laughs> All right. And our last panelist here is Maine Burke. Oh, Kalina, you're 83? 83. 83, yeah, 80. I'm 84. So these are the classes that we graduated. Uh, Maine Burke credits uh, as a production designer include the new hit show Lopez, directed by Troy Miller and starring Joe, Joe Lope, Lo, George Lopez, excuse me. Waking Madison, directed by Catherine Brooks and starring Elizabeth Shue and Taryn Manning. Something New, directed by, uh, uh, let's see, Taxi, directed by Tim Story. Uh, starring Queen Latifah and Jimmy Fallon, SWAT, directed by Clark Johnson, starring Colin Farrell and Samuel L. Jackson, The Princess Diaries, directed by Gary Marshall, starring Julie Andrews, which is our uh, interesting connection here, and Anne Hathaway, Rockstar, directed by Stephen Herrick, uh, starring Mark Wahlberg and Jennifer Aniston, 15 Minutes, uh, starring Robert De Niro, Jack Frost, directed by Troy Miller, uh, high uh, Michelle's High School Reunion, directed by David Mirkin, starring Lisa Kudrow and Mira Sorvino. He also designed the acclaimed HBO original film Don King, Only in America, and the Clio award-winning Levi's commercial Elevator Fantasy. Uh, so, uh, some of his credits as an art director include The Fan, From Dust Till Dawn, Grace of My Heart, Four Rooms, Don't Tell Mom the Babysitter's Dead, and Teenage Minja, Minja Newton Turtles. Can't say that. One and, uh, two and three. And uh, let's see, what year did you graduate? 87. 87, so Maine Burke. <laughs> so I think I'll just start with Howard, and you want to say a few words about Oliver and maybe what you remember? <laughs> well, sure. Um, uh, you know, I was trying to remember something specifically that Oliver inspired me, but it, it was more, you know, his, you know, the first thing that you struck you about him was his persona. There's this very tall, you know, it's utter gentleman, you know, with white hair. And um, at the time, in 1979, uh, I, 
uh, you know, had just come from uh, Virginia, and I, my dream was to go to New York and work on Broadway. Uh, and I kind of exploded when I arrived in New York. Um, and uh, all the senior class members uh, uh, told me that I had to change my name, I had to behave myself, and I would, because I was Howie, you know, and they made me change to Howard. And, uh, but I had felt that it was okay for me to have blue hair in 1979, which was very early on. And uh, I was about to take Oliver's class and I showed up mid-semester with blue hair and all the senior people said, you can't do this. And you know, and it was like, so I, it ended up that I, you know, kept the blue hair. I did go to Oliver's class. We, Oliver, you know, you know, there was a certain method that you were supposed to be using gouache and different kinds of mirror, and I was, wouldn't do any of that. I would only use watercolor, and I was using markers, which was, nobody used markers, and you know. And you know, the thing that struck me about him is he just embraced me for who I was. And he, it wasn't, uh, you know, he, so he, I, he allowed me to be me. Um, you know, it wasn't until later that I realized that Oliver's use of color probably is one of the most distinctive things about his design. That and movement and, you know, his inspiration for design came from the body, from, you know, dancers and from uh, the music. And uh, at the time I was into color in a big way. And so, uh, and fortunately that paid off for me, but he, he just was, it was an amazing sort of, um, you know, his generosity, and I think Kalina brought that up, and also Maine, we were talking before this, and it was like, he is the most incredibly generous person, and because he would allow you to, and he would, could see what you were going to do, and sort of just take it a step further, and that's what made him a great teacher. Well, and part of his generosity was bringing, like, the luminaries of the theater world, and, and every world, to, to our design show at the end of the year. Yes, and uh, I'm my graduate, uh, what was it, I guess my second year show, um, I had then had white, I, I was a skinhead, I think, at that point. And, uh, and I was wearing Doc Martens, were sort of the big thing, and, uh, and uh, I was in charge of the, doing the design show, so I was running around, he comes in, he always brought, you know, because he was, you know, the American Ballet Theater co-director for so long, he would always bring somebody in, and I remember uh, bumping into this woman and turning, and I stepped on her foot, and I, and I looked down, I had these boots, and I looked down and I went, and I just saw her foot and I said, oh, I'm so sorry. And I looked up and there's Makarova. So I stepped on, you know, who was the prima ballerina, and I, you know, the ultimate, you know, dancer, and, and I stepped right on her. She goes, don't worry, darling, it's just my foot. <laughs> so, so uh, he, yeah, it was like, to have that kind of connection, and well, to be you know, so inspired different years, by he that. brought Jackie Onassis. He brought the year, the second year, my second year. He brought Baryshnikov. So that would have been your third. That would have been your third year. Yes. Yes. Yeah. So uh, Kalina, do you have uh, some memories? Well, uh, quite a few. But um, I arrived. Um, you just just a little bit of history. In 1979, I landed in New York. I had escaped with my family from Bulgaria, so my English was not very good. I spoke French and I had three months to learn English. That I was given an ultimatum by the NYU, you have to learn English. <laughs> and so I had three months, I watched a lot of soap operas. But somehow or not, <laughs> I got to Oliver's class and he always called me that Russian girl. He could never remember <laughs> I was from Bulgaria. <laughs> so I was that Russian girl forever. Um, uh, and he was, the one thing that is like, you have to understand that when you grow up in a communist country, musicals are the last thing on your mind that they simply don't exist as a genre. They're practically forbidden. They're, they're uh, you know, uh, corrupting the youth of Bulgaria. So I, I had no, I had no knowledge of musicals. I knew opera, Bulgaria is very big on opera. I knew opera and operetta and the first thing when you go into Oliver's class, you start with ballet. Well, that was good. We had ballet. We did very well with that. Uh, and I loved watercolor, so we became really simpatico right away. But when we got to musical, it was a disaster because he assigned me company, and I had no clue. I really, truly was drowning. And he very kindly looked at me and said, you really, really don't understand musicals. And I said, yes, I really don't, but I understand Mozart. <laughs> so we agreed, so I ended up with, uh, doing Magic Flute. 
And the one thing I would say as a teacher is he never wanted you to drown. He never wanted you to fail. And even though musicals was his genre, he didn't, and when he realized it simply was too much for me to speak English, to understand so many things, he helped, you know, he just gave me a lifeline so that I can thrive as a student and I can feel empowered. And he was really behind the designs. And mind you, I had very, also from Europe, I had very avant-garde ideas about theater. And he would embrace it. He was this classical teacher, classical Broadway musical teacher. And yet, if I came up with some completely insane idea, he would totally embrace it because he understood, as long as you can back it up and you can tell him why you were doing it, and then you could do sketches and you can prove your idea, he was incredibly, incredibly generous. And it's a really, an amazing, teachers who are like that impact your life forever, I think. Well, and I think the atmosphere he created, he, he, it was sort of like just working in class on your projects. And he would come over with his cigarette with the long ash on it and the, and the, and the um, ashtray. And, uh, you know, and he, yeah. Maine, you want to tell, tell what you said to me earlier when we first talked about this? Oh, yeah. Well, um, ultimately, I wanted to be a, a lighting designer, a Broadway lighting designer. And in undergraduate school, right away, I had to take set design classes. And the set design teachers, right from the beginning, said, you know, you, you, you're pretty good at this stuff. You ought to consider set design and lighting design. And when I got to uh, NYU, I you know, couldn't wait to study with Oliver, but he's second year. And during the summer, we all got a, a letter that said, pick one of these three ballets and come to class with a nice big watercolor rendering. And I, I didn't paint as well as some of the other set design majors. And so I always, from the beginning of set design one, would always try and find a corner to put my painting in so that it was not immediately noticed. And it, Oliver came into the classroom, that first class, and he, he walked around the whole room and then he started going right towards mine and I thought he's going to tear me apart in front of everybody and make an example and I remember that I had done this incredible, I did Rites, Rites of Spring, I had done this incredible backdrop that was extremely vibrant and there were four little dancers down in the center of the stage and he looked at it and he said, whose is this? And I said, mine. He said, this is brilliant. He said, you're working on a scale larger than theater, you're going to do all your musicals for me this year as movies. And that was the beginning of it. And I, I actually got out of NYU and I, was, I immediately started art directing commercials. I never did any theater again. And that was the beginning of it. And he, he was very insightful. He saw something in, my, in this watercolor rendering that screamed of, of film. But I want to point out that Oliver, we knew, we all knew this when we got there. Oliver was the king of moving scenery. His sets flew. And it was based on doing scene changes off Vista in ballet, where you'd literally watch the backdrop fly in, and the wings, the things would come in from the wings and the wagons. And that's a very cinematic style already. And the natural progression, you know, there was theater and musicals before there were movies. So if you, like you said, he did bridge that gap. When Hollywood decided to do musicals in the 50s, they were inspired already by his moving scenery. And even if you look at the Cone Brothers movie, Hail Caesar, yeah. they've got the wagons in the, you know, in the, yeah, and that, that's, that's Oliver, that's Broadway. And you were also told that Oliver, every line set, there's all these line sets in the theater and they're on six inch centers. You knew if you were doing a show with Oliver that only the ones that the lighting is underneath, every other line set was going to be used by Oliver. He was notorious for that. And so. Well, uh, to that point, I just talked to Ted Sinisi, who was his longtime assistant, one of his last assistants, and she also was the person that got 10,000 pieces of his artwork and drafting put in the Library of Congress. Uh, and, uh, and kind of fun, is like the centerpiece of their musical theater uh, section. And uh, she's now recreating uh, uh, My Fair Lady for the Opera House in Sydney based on Oliver's drawings. And they had promised her line sets on six inch centers because it's like a, a she said it's like a cuckoo clock or a magical clock this the double turntables turn and things fly in, barely missing each other, and it's all clockwork, and if they're not exactly right, it's not gonna work. Well, this opens in August, and they just came back and said, well, everything's on eight inch centers. So now they're having to, and, and it only, the grid, if those of you that, like Steve, who knows theater, is only 53 feet. So it's, it's gonna be fascinating. I'm gonna try to get down there to see it, but Julie Andrews is directing it, and it should be quite spectacular. So, um, but that's a good point. Uh, I wanna ask you guys maybe, uh, a brief answer to when, you're, when you've worked in the theater uh, or in film, which most of you work in, 
Was there a moment that you thought, oh, I see that was Oliver's influence on my work? All the time. <laughs> <laughs> I can give a specific example. Um, one of the things that Oliver taught me is how to pack a stage with scenery. And it's a real gift, I mean, it's a real skill. And when we got to Grey Gardens, for budget reasons, we couldn't get a big enough stage. And you know, Grey Gardens, everything was a set. The facade was built on a, on a, in, in a field somewhere. And then the interiors, where well, the entire house was inside the stage. So I was really struggling. I tried to convince the producers to go to a bigger stage. It did not work out. And at the end of the day, I ended up doing the set diagonally to use the, and I used absolutely every inch of the stage. But I really thought, I literally heard his voice in my head that gave me the idea to do that. So I, I actually kind of use a lot of the stuff I learned from him all the time. Howard, anything? Uh, well, I think specifically work-wise, probably when I was doing uh, Liberace, uh, I, there were two things that I remembered that maybe, you know, I, I thought of Oliver and that was color. Uh, because the man was crazy, and he, there was a, it, and but but then in the story there was also this moment where there was no color, and so I kind of wanted. I thought, and Oliver, as you can even see in the bandwagon, he always juxtaposed uh, the black and white set with the, you know, and I, I, that influence, that concept of him going from color to black and white, is something that I took to. I used it in Usual Suspects. Um, when Kevin Spacey is telling the story of, you know, what happened, I we I called that that whole movie the usual locations actually because <laughs> we didn't have any money and it was all TV movie kind of stuff and there was the Herald Examiner's you know office everybody had shot a million things there and I I said I have to paint it and they were going what and I had to convince the people who were the location people that that managed that, that it was okay for me to do it because I wanted it all black and white. Because it was important to me that whenever you were out of that and you were somewhere, it told you exactly where you were. And that came from Oliver, you know, uh, telling me that. Same thing I uh, happened when I w worked on The Nick. It was like, okay, the heart of the story is the hospital. And I said, it's all gonna be black and white. And, and Steven Soderbergh on that one actually wanted the to shoot it in black and white, he's, but nobody would fund that. So, so there are those moments. And then uh, in the Liberace, I haven't gotten to do, you know, I, got, I left school and immediately went into film and knew that's where I wanted to be. But on the Liberace project, I got to do all of his shows. And we got to be in the same theater that he did those shows on. And um, I used every line set that was possible. <laughs> and so much so that we went to, and I also convinced everybody that Michael Douglas really should be on a wire and fly, as, because it was CGI in the script. And I said, no, no, it's, he's got to actually fly. And they said, well, you have to deal with Michael, and you have to deal with the rehearsal. And the, um, I had a meeting with a guy who was the rigging, flying rigging guy. And I, I'm going through, I said, no, it's really tight. I mean, everything is. He goes, yeah, yeah, this is all fine. And then we get to there and he goes, I can't do this. And I had to figure out some way to make the line sets work, you know, and make still get Michael to fly. His feet just barely cleared the, <laughs> you know, because of how high it could go. But, uh, but th that was, you know, you know, those moments are when I think of Oliver. So I want to check with the Cinematheque. I know it's 6.30. Perfect. So if everyone's okay, we're going to just extend the discussion a little bit further. Um, I don't think anybody will have a problem with that. Um, usually we have the discussions afterwards, but now you'll get to go home after the film. Oh, after the film, I'm going to show two clips. One of them is Poor Game Bess, I'm sorry, but uh, I'll explain to that later. And the other one is a bit from Oklahoma. And I feel like so many people have seen Oklahoma, but the thing for me that is so striking in Oklahoma is if you know Fall River Legend and you know Rodeo and you know his ballets, you see, you know, he's basically recreating them, you know, at the same time. And uh, so when you, is there, you know, I want to ask some more, so. You want me to go yes. on? Yes. <laughs> well, now that I told you that I had no clue about musicals, um, eventually I grew as a designer and I actually really started loving musicals and one of the main reasons I did Smash season two was to do musicals 
uh, uh, to do some musical numbers, to design a musical, and really, really thought about Oliver every, um, every time I had a number. And, and if you know anything about television, doing a musical number in a television environment is incredibly ambitious because they never give you enough prep. Um, so, and nobody in the season one had thought about bringing the composer, the lyricist, the choreographer, and the designer together. So at least I was able to initiate that. <laughs> we actually real collaboration. Some, real collaboration. We were able to do some coherent work. But it was really, um, I, I find it that the power of the artist is there on the screen to, to, to live forever. But the power of the teacher lives through every single student that they leave behind. And he, was an, he wasn't just a national treasure because he was a designer, but he was a national treasure because he was an unbelievable person and an incredibly elegant man. And for, I know he had liquid lunches, I believe, sometimes yes. too. <laughs> there's always a martini before there's class. There's always a martini. Yeah. Yeah. Class was at two o'clock and you could smell the martini on his breath when he came around to you. Yeah, yeah. and he, just, he was just a very elegant, elegant person. And I just feel we, we, we were very lucky to have him. And he I, was an I, honorary uh, member of the Friars yeah. Club and he was a Freemason, <laughs> if that tells you anything. Well, and you know, so much of what he did for American Ballet Theater was fundraising. So in a way, I think that makes sense, you he's, know? Yeah, he is perfect. That, yes, he is a, a figurehead as well. So. Yeah, and um, for me, he just represented elegance in class. And you know, it was sort of like, uh, I mean, we all know that we had Fred's class the year before and we were beat, really beaten up. And so, you know, at school, uh, NYU was really then like a boot camp. And, you really had to, I mean, I think if you missed a project or if you showed up late, you were basically out of school. I mean, there was so much pressure. Uh, I've, since I have a captive audience, there's one <laughs> Oliver story that I have to tell, and that was, like, okay, it's last day of school. I'm getting my stuff out of the design studio. We're packing up, and uh, at the time, the, it was a, was it a hot dog pla packing plant? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, it was, it was, a meat the, it was on you know it, this rundown building that we were in. The faculty off. There was one office for the faculty, and then uh, and we only had one phone for the whole building. And so I was upstairs in the design studio, and they were doing the faculty review or your final reviews. And I went to go use the phone, and I realized they had the phone off the hook to not be disturbed, and I was hearing the reviews. And of course, I didn't put the phone down. And I'm waiting, and I'm going, what, whose name are they on? Are they doing it alphabetically? Because if so, I'm coming up. And so I'm sitting there on the phone, and there are other people in the studio, and I'm going, shut up, shut up. And that I'm listening, and, they're, and there I get to hear all of the professors critique me. I knew going into this that I was, point to my grade point average wasn't high enough to graduate. And I, so I was sweating it and I was going like, and uh, so all the other teachers are going and uh, a couple of Fred Vopel ripped into me, <laughs> you know, because I kind of blew off his class on he wasn't just, you know, uh, or I did it really quickly and he, he'd just get really angry at me. John Gleason, the lighting designer, wanted me to be a lighting designer, and I did sit, and I blew him off too. So they were, <laughs> so they were all like going, "We're not, don't graduate the guy. He's like, you know, he's clearly not, you know, you know, he's a terrible student, which I was." And uh, and then uh, it, they were going round and round, and all of, and Oliver just spoke up and he said we're graduating him, and that's the end of the discussion, and they moved on. And so I knew that I was gonna graduate, but it was because Oliver- And you heard this. Yeah, Oliver stood up for me, and you know, and uh, so I sort of been eternally grateful that I wasn't, didn't fail at NYU, but it was only because of Oliver's good graces and his, you know, support that I, you know, got to be, go on. He saved me in a similar way. There was a show that I was doing off Off Broadway, and it was on Theater Row, and the faculty was incensed because we were not allowed to work when we were in school. No. And, uh, and everybody was mad about it. And I remember uh, Sal or somebody told me that they had the meeting and it was the meeting to decide whether I would continue because of this infraction. And evidently it was Oliver who spoke up and he said, he's doing great in my class, just leave him alone. <laughs> well, I told you guys earlier that uh, 
I was very fortunate my third year I got to do an HBO collaboration with NYU. It was called the Young Director Series and it was the first time HBO was doing it and NYU supplied three films and Columbia supplied three films. By the way, the, one of the Columbia films was Ben Stiller's. And uh, I went to the faculty after I did the film, I went to the head of the department, Lloyd Burlingame, and I asked if I could put the film on a loop in the design show at the end of the year, the big design show. And he said, I have to check with the rest of the faculty. No one's ever done this. You're supposed to do three penny opera, and that's supposed to be your thesis project. And they made me wait three months. They had full staff meetings once a month, and it took three of them before they finally decided that I could do it. But I also had to do three penny opera as well. But I found out that it was Oliver that pushed it through. He was the one who said, the guy's designed musicals for me as movies. He's clearly going in this direction. I don't care that no one's ever done this before in, at NYU. This is the future, you know? And it's, it's, I was saddened to hear what you told me that as an art direction program there now, there's, there's very little interest. They've gone well, back to basics. Well, we're hoping to get it better. Well, Kalina, so, you wanna? Yeah. <laughs> so for those of you, uh, um, I just wanna explain something about Fred Vopel, this other teacher that, that, oh, <laughs> that's oh, been mentioned. Oh, no, you have to understand, you have to understand something. We were only two women studying set design. There were very few women. At the time I was a student, there were very few women. If you, en uh, if you entered the program, they immediately tried to assign you to costumes if you're a woman. Um, so I fought very hard to become a set designer, and in my broken English, I told them, I don't do buttons. So whatever that meant, I just said, I don't do buttons. That was, so I was known for that Russia girl that doesn't do buttons. Um, so anyway, so the, the bottom line is, though, um, uh, Fred Vopel in his first year told me, you'll never make it in this country because you're a foreigner. So this is, <laughs> when they tell you NYU anyway, was a boot camp, he was worse than he that. He also told me that I had to change my name because no one would be able to spell it or pronounce it, which is true, <laughs> but, but anyway, so anyway. We digress. If it wasn't for Oliver, if it wasn't for Oliver, I probably would not have been able to stay in the program, but Oliver really, again, as I have to say, is he truly understood where you were coming uh, from as an artist. He really didn't care if you were a woman, if you were from Bulgaria, or from whatever it was. Or if you had blue hair. Oh, you had blue <laughs> hair. <laughs> so we well, only uh, have a couple of minutes left. So um, there's gonna be a little bit more Q&A if, if anybody wants to stay afterwards. I'm not sure how tired it'll be, but Steve, do you have anything you wanna add? Um, no, I just, I love all this. I have all the same stories that you guys have. <laughs> Absolutely. I do wanna say, though, that Oliver did ride the subway because I once got body checked by him <laughs> in Times Square subway station. He, he's a gentleman, but when he wants to get on a subway car, he's going to get on it. <laughs> <laughs> Peter, are you out there? Yeah. You want to say anything? Yeah, I, uh, it's a pleasure to hear your stories. They're, uh, mine are very similar. And uh, I came to NYU from studying one year at CalArts and decided or had a series of dreams that took me straight to NYU in the middle of the summer. So they did something that um, was unusual. They transferred me right into Design 2. Mm -hmm. I don't think Fred's awful like that. And um, <laughs> later he would have his due and bring me back from Design 2 with uh, Oliver and then Conklin back. Then I'd go back to Design 1 and then my third year I'd Design 3. So, um, but that first year, and I can really understand what you said, Howard um, and Kalina. 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 It was intimidating, and it was a it was a rush to be in Oliver's class. I mean, it was like I had grown up loving West Side Story, and my high school teacher let me do an independent study uh, and had me designing theater as a 16-year-old, you know, taught me about all of the respect. And then I get to go study with him, so it was amazing. That work in Design 2 for me is probably the most special with Oliver that I had there. You know, then Fred did his thing on me. Well, and you know, uh, you know, Oliver also designed the interiors for most of the Schubert theaters, and he also did a lot of restaurants, and I remember talking to him about it, and I said, oh, you're doing interior design? And he says, it's just like the stage. You gotta get them on, you gotta get them off. <laughs> So, um, you know, one, one little story. In, in Design 2, uh, I was new in New York. The hottest ticket that season was Les Miserables. And you just could not get a ticket to it. But they had decided on the dark night of 
Broadway on a Monday, they would have a special performance uh, as a fundraiser for the AIDS. Gypsy uh, performance. A, you know, raising money for the AIDS prevention. So I got a ticket to that. It was like way, it was like the worst seat in the house. It was way up in the nosebleed section. And I watched that show. And I was so proud that I'd seen it. So I go into Design 2 that day, that next day, and I say to Oliver, I saw Lame as a mob. And I'm so excited. And he goes, So what'd you think of it? And I said, um, That turntable, it was amazing. It just kept doing things. And, and I was like so full of that turntable. And he looked at me and he goes, Well, that turntable had turned one more time. I think I would have upset my stomach and vomited. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I said, Well, I loved it. And I wish they turned it and made it yeah. fly. So we have to quit, I'm afraid. But um, we'll be back for a Q&A. But I want to thank my panelists. Thank you so much. Thank you, Peter. Thank you, Stephen. Sorry, guys.